covered all of the safety stuff. You guys should know safety stuff. Safety glasses, one person in the yellow square of danger, no baggy clothing, all of that stuff you should know. Safety stuff I don't need to cover again. Uh, this part in time, or this point in time, we're actually going to be covering the names of all of the pieces on the lathe. Uh, you will be tested on this, uh, so please do pay attention and fill along on that sheet as we go. Uh, but quick disclaimer, I teach metal work, I teach machining, I am not a machinist. I'm sort of a jack of all trades. I do a little bit of everything. By no means do I have a red seal in machining. I'm pretty good at it, but that doesn't mean I'm an expert. So there's different ways that you can refer to some of these things, and there's different ways to talk about them. I'm going to do the best that I can, which is all I expect from you guys. First, all of your brains are located in what part of your body, your head? All the brains for the lathe are located up here. This big box, this whole unit up here is called the headstock. You probably should write this down on your sheet and label it. This part of the lathe is called the headstock. This is where all of the magic happens. This has the motor, the gears, and the main on-off power switches that allow this lathe to function. All of the brains of the lathe are located in the headstock. On the headstock, there's some really important stuff. There's the power lockout switch at the back, which we all know about because you have to lock it out whenever you make adjustments. We've got the chuck key, We've got the tool holder for the Jacobs chuck for the live or dead center. There's going to be some Allen keys, and there'll be some various tools that'll sit on top of the headstock. Quick safety thing that I do need to mention. You have a whole pile of tools sitting on top of the headstock when you're working. That's a really good way to get hurt, especially if you're working on something that's off center. Things tend to vibrate. They'll fall into the lathe chuck. They'll go for a ride. Make sure your work area is clean. Just like welding, you don't want to have a whole bunch of stuff floating around if you're going to be welding. You don't want to have a whole bunch of stuff sitting on this headstock. Nice flat place to keep things. Try to keep it clean. The headstock. There's these levers right here. These levers are your high, low speed adjustments. And you can adjust the speed all the way down to like 80 RPM. And I think this lathe goes up to 200. Most of the projects that we're going to be doing in this class are 460. I'll show you what that looks like and more importantly what it sounds like. 460 looks and sounds like that. If I was going to turn it up, let's say if it sounds like that, it's probably too fast. There is a huge long mathematical process that my seniors go through figuring out what diameter piece, what material, how fast you should machine it. We're not going to do that in this class because it would take a long time and to be honest you guys aren't doing that. So in the meantime, 460, general rule of thumb. Some things will need to be a little bit faster. Obviously for steel or larger things, you're gonna go slower. If you look at drilling a huge drill bit through a piece of metal, you want it to go slow. If you're working on a huge piece of metal, you wanna go slow. Tiny little drill bit, you can go fast. Does this make sense? Okay, same type of thing. The work, particularly I have a piece of aluminum here, is attached to the chuck, which is attached to the spindle, which is all on the headstock. This particular chuck is a three jaw chuck. A three jaw chuck is handy because all of the jaws move at the same time. Write this down because it will be on the test. A three jaw chuck typically holds on to round stuff or round stock or hex shaped stuff, six sided stuff. A three jaw chuck all the jaws move together. So what they do is they self-center. A four-jaw chuck, like this one, all the jaws move independently. So I can actually tighten up, or I can loosen each particular jaw at the same time. 
You guys see that? They don't move together. Keenan, you hold that for a second. How heavy is that, Keenan? Like 20 pounds. Like 20 pounds. Not too bad. So he says this is 20 pounds. This thing's spinning around at 460 RPM. You don't tighten up this to the spindle, very bad things will happen. 20 pounds spinning around at like 50 miles an hour, probably not a good thing if it lets go. There's these little dogs on the back. They say locked or unlocked. Make sure they're locked before you get started on the lathe. I don't trust any of you. You shouldn't trust me. It takes one second to look to see if they're locked on or not. It would be a bad thing to go, ah, and just assume that it's set up. Maybe somebody was halfway through switching up a chuck and they forgot. So quick review, a three-jaw chuck holds on to round stuff and hex stuff. A four-jaw chuck, what do you think it holds on to? Square. Square stuff. That's an excellent idea. But here's the interesting thing. A four-jaw chuck can hold on to any shape, not just square. It can hold on to round, rectangular, triangular, hex, whatever you have, even some goofy like egg shape. The reason it can hold on to anything is because those jaws move independently. The problem, or the tricky thing with a four jaw chuck, is it doesn't self-center. So it's going to wobble all over the place unless you get it exactly centered where you want it to be. Does that make sense? Okay. Two different types of chucks. I can talk about a face plate as well. A face plate is like, it looks like a dinner plate with a bunch of slots on it. That's what you'd attach a big whatever random shape to, something that doesn't fit nicely in jaws. Like you could clamp it to a table, and that spins around. Like some weird random shape, you'd use a faceplate. We rarely, rarely use a faceplate, if ever. Next thing that's really important, this unit here, this whole kind of contraption that has all of these wheels on it, all of this stuff, rests on that one thing, and I believe that is R on your diagram. This is what's called the carriage. And the way you can remember is a carriage has a bunch of wheels on it. I didn't name it, but it's a way to remember what it's called. And the carriage rides all the way along the apron. Sometimes it's called the apron or the lathe bed. And on top of that, there's these little kind of triangular shaped things that are actually like railroad tracks. So L is called the waves, W-A-Y-S. And the waves are like little railroad tracks that the carriage rides on as it goes up and down the lathe. It doesn't matter what country in the world you go to or what type of lathe you use, the large wheel on the bottom of the carriage always does the same thing. It controls the longitudinal feet. And the way you can remember this is it moves a long ways. You never say left and right or in and out on a lathe because it's relative to where you're standing. This way it would be in and out or forward or backwards. This way it would be left and right. If it was on the other side, it would be right and left. But if I say longitudinal feet, doesn't matter where you're standing, you know it moves a long ways up and down. And just like a map, if this way is longitudinal feet, the middle wheel always does the same thing, which is lateral. Longitudinal, lateral. Like latitude on a map, this is your latitude. Or sometimes referred to as cross feet, because it moves across the lane. So the middle wheel, this would be, I think, C on your diagram. Then there's this guy up at the top. This one on your diagram looks to be E. This is what's called your compound rest, because it can cut what's called compound angles. That's another way to refer to this. Compound rest cuts compound angles, and the way you Adjust it so with an Allen key. There's two kind of grub screws or Allen head bolts on either side, and you can actually adjust the angle whichever you want it to be. So if I was going to cut like a long taper in something, 
I could set it up and I could cut into it with a long taper using the compound rest. So again, quick review, carriage, longitudinal feed wheel, cross feed wheel or lateral, and this is the compound rest. On top of the compound rest, we have what's called a quick change tool post. Quick change tool post has a bunch of different parts on it. It's got a tool bit. This is what does all the cutting. And there's a bunch of different types of tool bits. Uh, this one is particularly a carbide bit. Very, very, very hard piece of steel at the end of it that can cut just about anything. There's other ones. This one's called a knurling bit. There's parting bits. There's all kinds of different bits. This one's pretty good because it's a jack of all trades. Doesn't matter what you throw at it, it's going to work. Tool bit. The thing that it holds is a tool rest. It rests in there. And this guy here is called the tool post. And this one's called a quick change tool post because you can quickly change it. There's other kinds that are not that quick. And to do so, you can actually adjust the height with this lever here on the top of it. Now, as far as the height is concerned, where do we want that tool, the very little tiny tip of that, where do we want that to be in relation to our work? We want it dead center, what I like to call the nine o'clock position. So if you were looking at a chuck, you want it at nine o'clock. So please write that down. You want the tip of your tool bit to be at nine o'clock or just the slightest, tiniest, tiniest bit below it. But if you're dead at nine o'clock, you're not gonna screw up. Now, if I'm too low or too high, I'm gonna have like a little nipple in the middle of my work when I'm done, and you'll be able to tell because the work can't get into the center. How you line it up, you can either use your eyeball gauge, I'm good at that, or you can swing it around, and if I had a drill bit in the Jacobs chuck, or better, I had a live center like this one, and this was sitting in there, I could bring the whole carriage back and I could line it up on this side to find out where the center was. Does that make sense? Okay. So I think I just mentioned this as well. So we've got the carriage, ways, the apron and the bed is like the whole frame of the lathe. This business at the back, what the heck is this? Well, this is the tailstock. Headstocks on one side, Tailstocks on the other side. Tailstock is an important part of the lathe, but it's not as important as the carriage. It's important for different reasons. Tailstock's responsible for two major things. Major thing number one is it steadies long work. Imagine I had a pipe that was like three feet long and I was doing a bunch of machining on it. Well, it's going to wiggle if it's spinning around really fast because there's nothing supporting this end. So you'd use what's called a center drill, drill the end of it out, or you'd have this rest up against the end of it, and it has a bearing in it, so as it spins around, it's almost like a hand's holding on on this side if I'm working on a big, long pipe. This tailstock has two main major purposes. It holds on to long stuff steady. The second thing that it can do is with this guy, it's a Jacob's chuck, just like you'd find on a drill press or a hand drill, we use it to drill holes in our work. Now, on that note, just like when you drill a hole in a piece of sheet metal or anywhere in the shop, you center punch it first to mark your hole so the, the drill bit center aligns. We use what's called a center drill to pre-drill to a little tiny pilot hole in any round stock, anything. And that way, it's like a center punch on the lathe. I'll go over that in a little bit more detail when we get to work. But we use a center drill first, then you can use any drill bit just like you regularly would. Except here's the weird thing that it's hard for people to wrap their minds around. The drill holes on the lathe is the opposite. Picture on a drill press. The chuck spins around on a drill press, right? This doesn't move, your work does. So imagine the vise spinning around lots on the drill press as the drill bit doesn't move and go down. It's totally backwards, but it still works. That's how this works. On this, this is by the way, J on your diagram. This is what's called the tailstock. The tailstock has some really important features. It's got the tailstock feed wheel, which is K on your diagram. The tailstock wheel on the back. Don't touch it if 
you're not sure what it does, because some people will extend it out all the way. And, or worse, this is the big one, uh, H. Tail stock feed lock is H on your diagram. That's this little lever here. It's this little cam lock. That basically what it does is it prevents the tail stock feed, it prevents this wheel from moving. So you push on it, you push on it, you push on it, and it's not moving. I was sitting around the bar with a couple shop teachers and we were talking about how to explain this to students so that they would never forget. This is the actual answer that myself and my shop teacher friends came up with. If it doesn't feel right, don't keep pushing because if you keep pushing on something on this lathe, eventually something's going to break. It's like taking a poop. You push hard enough, eventually you're going to break something. That's the analogy we came up with. So if it's not moving, don't keep pushing. This lathe should be delicate. It's really, really powerful, but if not taken care of, you can snap nuts and bolts, strip out all kinds of things on the inside of this. You catch that? H on this is basically prevents this from moving. That's when you would use a live center. You don't ever need to use this, like 90% of the time, rarely. Just don't touch it, and that way you can move in and out. Now, how do we change that Jacob's Chuck? A really, really, really smart guy invented something called a Morris taper. A Morris taper kind of works like a Chinese finger trap. Suction. No glue, no threads, no bolts, no nothing. This taper holds in that tail stock. That's it. And it holds it in so tight, the only way to remove it, I can pull on that all day, it's not coming up. The only way to remove it is to go backwards as far as you can, and then eventually it'll come up. Then I can switch it up with say something like a live center. All it is, that's it. It's locked in there now. The only way to get it out is to pull it back. That's called a Morris taper. This lever on the back that you can't quite see, it goes like this. I had to stay till 5 o'clock yesterday and fix that one that was stripped out because somebody hit it with a hammer. Because, oh, it's too tight. I can't remove it. Well, then ask for help. Don't hit it with a hammer. So, the way this works is this is what's called the tail stock lock. And it locks it in position. So when I'm drilling a hole in something, if this is floating around, I go to drill a hole in it, it's just going to push the tail stock back. Whereas if I lock it and I squeeze it down on the ways, it's not going to move. Does that make sense? So on your picture, that would be I, tail stock lock. Now the last thing that I have to talk about in grade 9, 10 metalwork, we're not going to use. There's two automatic feed or threading features that we are not going to use because, to be honest, guys, there is no safety on this lathe. Yeah, there's an on and off switch, but the lathe doesn't know if it hurts you, it doesn't know if it hurts somebody else, and it doesn't know if it hurts itself. It's just going to keep going until it blows up. So here's the way it works. We've got a power switch on at the back, we've got a stop switch at the front, We've got our main on-off, which is attached to the carriage. And we have these two levers here. Up and over is for the automatic cross feed. Down and over is for that automatic longitudinal feed. And we have the threading feature, which is on the right-hand side. So that will be S and T on your diagram. This is why I don't want you to use it. I flick on the lathe, I flick on the automatic threading tool, or sorry, the automatic feed, lathe moves on its own. There is nothing preventing that from ramming into the chuck. It doesn't know. And no offense, grade nines, I don't know if you're responsible enough to use that yet. If you can prove to me, you know what, Mr. Herman, I know what I'm doing, fine. But in the meantime, just do it manually. It works just as well, and for most of the projects we're going to be making in here, you don't need to worry about it. The last thing I will mention is the most important, which is why I saved it for last, as far as the tool section, or sorry, the names of the pieces of the tools. 
S and T are the automatic feed adjustment or the threading adjustment or on off switches basically. Most important thing I left to the very end. Our lathes are equipped with a foot brake. I never want you to use the foot brake ever unless it's an emergency. Best way I can describe it, it's like the lathe gets into a car accident when you hit it. Lathe spinning around really fast. It slams the gears together with a brake. It shocks it. It stops it dead. And if you do that, it's bad for the lathe, but it's good for you. Because if something gets caught in the lathe, you'll stop it dead. So you click it on. Foot brake is at the bottom. You can stop the lathe dead. I never want you to use that unless it's an emergency. Because it's really bad for the lathe. Does that make sense? Okay. This concludes this section. The next section is actually how to machine stuff.